Hey guys, it's Davin here at Brewbits.com. Now, behind the camera as usual, we've got James. Say hello, James. Right, now a neighbour of mine has had a prolific year with his plum trees, and so he's given me bagfuls. So, what else can I do apart from make some plum wine? So, what are we going to need to make some plum wine? Uh, well, first of all, we're going to need some plums, and these are lovely, juicy, ripe plums. The riper, the better. We're also gonna need some sugars. So here I've got two different sugars. I've got a granulated sugar from the supermarket, and here I've got a brewing sugar. Now, basically, the reason why I'm using two is because the supermarket sugar will add a sweetness to the finished wine, uh, whereas the brewing sugar will just allow the yeast to munch away at it and create the alcohol. So you kind of get a slightly sweet wine, but it's not too sweet like some country wines can be. Then we're gonna need a few other bits and bobs. So on the ingredients side, we're gonna need some cleaner and sterilizer, and here I'm using VWP. We're gonna need some Camden tablets, some pectolase. Uh, let me pop to this one over here. So this is another enzyme called Ropet, or it's got some other names as well, but I'll explain that in a moment. We've got some yeast nutrients, some fermentation stopper, and I'm using some finings. Here I've got two different yeasts. Because I've got so many plums, I thought I would do two different uh, yeasts with this. A Bordeaux white and an all-purpose white. And there should be some differences with the finished wine just because we're using different yeasts. And then we've got our siphon to do our siphoning a bit later. We've got our thermometer to check temperatures and we've got our hydrometer so that we can check the specific gravity so that we can work out our alcohol contents. We're gonna need a straining bag a little bit later. And I've got my brewing bucket, although it's quite a big one. Size doesn't matter in this case. And I've also got my gallon demijohn. So now we've got all our ingredients together. Oh, one other thing needed. It's gonna take a bit of time to, to do the preparation bit. So um, I've got my trusty bit of wine to keep me going. So let's get brewing. So the first thing we need to do is we need to stone our plums. So you need a sharp knife, and it does take a little bit of time. So, it's quite easy. Take your plums, spin your knife around. One side will twist off nicely, and the other side will leave you the stone in. Right, I've got a few more pound of plums to go, so I'll see you in a moment. And on to the last one. Mm, pops. So I've got my three pound of um, plums all nicely chopped off. There's all the stones. So if you fancy a few hundred um, plum trees, go plant them. Now, come on in, James, get a nice and close look at this because I want you to get in here and I want you to give it a really good knocking up. Yeah. Down here, I've got my sterilized bucket. I've actually got a spoon inside as well, but in my plums go. Ooh, look at that, look at that. Little stone got there. Yeah. Lighter. Okay, and in our granulated sugar, and in goes our brewing sugar. You can sit for a couple of minutes. The sugar will soak out, suck out any uh, juices from the plums. And now I'm gonna put my kettle on, because I need six pints of boiling water. And the last pint, there we go. So that's six pints of boiling water. Now I know we're making a gallon of wine here, but the plums are very juicy and they're actually gonna add those other two pints and make it absolutely lovely and delicious. So give it a good stir so that all the sugar is dissolved. Lovely, that's all our sugar dissolved. So our lovely plummy sugary water is now too hot for us to do anything with. So I'm now just gonna pop the lid on 
and I'm gonna leave it for a few hours to cool down to 20 degrees C. It's taken a little bit of time for our plum juice to cool down. So come on in James, have a quick look at this. It's taken a couple of hours, it's already taken some color out of the skins. So what we're gonna do, because these didn't have a huge amount of color, here I'm using Roapept enzyme. Uh, you may also see it called uh, Rohavin color or something along those lines. And basically, come on in and have a look at this James, it's kind of a creamy powder. And you're not gonna need very much of this. Uh, probably about a quarter of a teaspoon per gallon. And this is a little enzyme and that's gonna basically make all of the colors uh, come out of the fruit and make it so that you get a really nice colorful um, wine. Now this is pectolase or also called peptic enzyme. And peptic enzyme, where you've got um, lots and lots of pectin in the fruit and back to me James especially where you've used um, something like plums now pectin very very good uh, when you're making jam because it causes the jam to set here in a wine though uh, it's not very good because it will cause a really hazy finished wine so we need to break down the pectin and the way we're going to do that is with this little white powder and that's going to eat away at the pectin and cause it to um, give us a nice finished wine. And simply just stir that in. Okay. Now we need to give a little bit of time for our enzymes to do their work. So we're gonna do that by leaving it for 24 hours. So what I wanna do now is so that nothing starts fermenting in there or anything like that, I'm gonna use here a Camden tablet and I'm going to simply take my Camden tablet and between two teaspoons, pop, ooh, there we go, one on the counter, the other one on the top, and it'll eventually start to break. And between them, look, break them up. There we go, and we end up with a little powder, and in that goes. Now that's going to let off a little bit of gas um, and also take out any oxygen, and that's going to help protect our wine until we're ready to add the heat. So we're now going to pop the lid back on and we're going to put this in a warm place, 20 degrees C, for the next 24 hours. It's been 24 hours since I added our Roapect enzyme and our pectolase. Now come on in James and have a look at this because it's really pulled the colour out of the plums and it's given it a real depth. Now if there was smell-o-vision, it's literally pure plum juice right now. Absolutely lovely. I've taken a sample in my trial jar so that we can get a reading with a hydrometer and it is coming out at uh, 0.994. So if that ferments to dryness, it will give us a wine at about 15% ABV. And if you don't want yours at 15% ABV, then right at the beginning, you can reduce your sugar by a little bit and that will give you a lower ABV. But now we're gonna add our yeast nutrient. And it's a simple thing, is a little white powder here. And I'm just gonna sprinkle in a teaspoon of yeast nutrient. And that's a bit like um, a vitamin, uh, like you and me need vitamins so that we can work really efficiently. And that's what it's gonna do for the yeast as well. It's gonna allow them to work really, really well. Last thing we're gonna add is our yeast. And here I'm using an all-purpose white wine yeast. And I'm simply going to chop the top off Whee. and sprinkle it in. And I'm just going to give it a little stir, get it all mixed in. There we go. Now I'm going to put the top on. I'm going to put this in my warm cupboard for seven days. That's going to be at 20 degrees Celsius. And each day I'm going to sterilize my spoon and I'm going to give this a just a quick gentle stir just to mix everything up. And after seven days, then we'll be looking at transferring into our demijohn. 
For you guys, it's been a few seconds. For me, I've had to wait seven days, and I've been stirring our plum wine now every single day with a sterilized spoon for the last seven days. Now, I've left it, I haven't stirred it today, but come on in, James, have a look at this. You'll see all the plums have started to uh, break up, and not too much though, and it's ready for us to move on. So, down here, I've got a second bucket, and in my second bucket, I've got a uh, straining bag. I'm actually using a mashing and sparging bag, which makes life a bit easier because it's a bit bigger, and fits nicely over the top. If you haven't, you can use muslin, um, and we're gonna gently just pour this in. Lovely, 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 lovely. All of it goes in. There we go. Now we're simply going to take our string bag, going to lift it up. You see, it's still quite a lot in there, so we're going to just give it a squeeze and get all that juice out of the plums. Now we're going to be popping it from our second bucket into our demijohn. And the way I'm going to be doing this is using a siphon. And of course, I've sterilized my demijohn, I've sterilized the siphon. And so, ooh, I'm getting a bit tangled up here. This end has got our little sediment trap, and that just goes in like this. Come on in, James, have a quick look. And we're just gonna pop this just below the surface. And this end here, over to me, James. We're gonna have a little suck until we get it through to the end, and then lower it down in. Now, back to me a second, James, because there's gonna be, ooh, a few of you going, oh, I'm putting my mouth on the end of the hose, why am I sterilizing and all of that, anyway. Um, if you don't want to put your mouth on the end of the hose and suck it through, then you can use one of these, and this is an auto siphon. And basically, that goes down inside your wine, and there's the tube that fits on the end here, and then you just pump it up and down a few times like that, and it will start the flow going. Um, basically, the bacteria that are in your mouth won't actually affect the wine. Uh, the bacteria that will affect the wine in terms of vinegar is actually within the air around you. So there's not a huge problem with doing it with your mouth. And if you're really lucky, you might get a sneaky taste of what the wine's going to be like. So we're just going to filter this, uh, siphon this down into our demijohn until we're up to the neck. So now we've got our wine in the demijohn, we need to pop in our airlock. And just pop in a second, James, and you'll see in the bottom of the airlock, I've half filled the bottom two bubbles, and that goes in. Okay, so this is now gonna carry on fermenting because this is gonna go back into my warm cupboard uh, at 20 degrees C for another two weeks so that it can finish its fermentation. For you guys, it's been just a couple of moments. For me, I've had to wait two weeks to get to here. And our bubbler has basically stopped uh, bubbling. So that gave me a good indication that our wine is finished. So what I've done is I've taken a sample in our trial jar. Come on in, James, and get close to this. And you'll see that it's coming out at 0 0.990. So what that's telling me is that the yeast have done their job. They've eaten all the sugars. And now they then started to get to work on other compounds in the wine and changing those into other acids and other compounds. And that process is gonna make this wine delish. So what do we do now? It's finished fermenting. So we need to take it off at the bottom of here. There's a load of sediment and we need to take it off of that sediment and into a clean sterilized demijohn using our siphon. So I've Popping out the airlock there, in it goes, and let's get it going. So don't push your siphon right down to the bottom because otherwise you'll disturb the sediment. Just follow just below the surface as the wine drops down the demijohn. As you can see, we've got quite a bit of uh, sediment left in our demijohn, but don't worry about that because we can get most of the wine out. And this is what we're left with. So, what are we doing now? Well, with the amount of wine that I had left in my trial jar, I've taken a cup, and I'm gonna be now adding our 
fermentation stopper and you can see I've put the wine from the trial jar into there. A fermentation stopper are like little tiny pellets and we don't need very much at all. So this is, um, in some places you'll see it called stabilizer, and pla other places you'll call it called, you'll see it called potassium sorbate. And what we do is we pop that into our little bit of wine there and we give it a little stir. What this is going to do, I'm going to leave that to dissolve. So what this is going to do, this is going to get to work within the wine and kill any remaining yeast that may be present. And that's gonna then help us when we add our findings in a couple of days time on the clearing process. So it dissolves pretty quickly. Here you go, James. You won't really notice very much difference. And what we need to do now is we need to gently pour it back into our demijohn. Lovely. Now we're gonna pop our airlock back in. So what's been happening during the fermentation, it, the yeast have been creating lots and lots and lots of carbon dioxide as well. And some of that carbon dioxide will come out through the bubbler and some of it actually gets stuck in the wine. And so what we need to do to get the um, fermentation stopper fully worked into the whole gallon of wine and to knock out that CO2, we're gonna take our demijohn we're going to swirl it. And you'll notice the bubbler starts going. That's not fermentation starting again. That's simply like if you've taken a can of Coke and you've shaken the can of Coke and you've popped open the top and all the gas spurts out. And that's what we're doing here. So we need to do this a few times. And you see every time I do it, there's more gas coming out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now leave this to sit for about another five, 10 minutes. And I'm gonna come back again, and I'm gonna do it again, and again, and again, and again. And I'll probably keep doing that over the next couple of days, probably once or twice a day. Brilliant, so that's the last swirl I'm gonna give it, because I've been swirling it a few times a day for the last couple of days, and it's knocked all the carbon dioxide out. So now we're on to the findings. And here I'm gonna be using uh, some findings called Vin Clear. And this is just a powder, let me just get that out. And this is a, a really old traditional finings. Um, as I say, it's just a powder. It's actually made from the swim bladder of a fish. So what we need to do is we need to take a sterilized glass and a sterilized siphon because we need to get a little bit of wine from here into our glass. And so now that, we're gonna simply pop that one in. Have a suck, but we're not sucking it all the way through. Ta-da! And that's all we really need. So let me pop that out of the way. And all we're going to need then is a teaspoon of our findings. And this goes in the glass. And we're going to give it a little stir to get it going. And whilst I'm waiting for that, let's pop the lid back on there. Uh, now, as I say, um, the Vin Clear does come in both liquid and powder form, and I'm using the powder form here. So, once you add it a little stir, we pop the airlock back in the one so that we don't get any problems there. And this here, I've got a little bit of cling film, and we're going to pop a bit of cling film over the top just to stop anything getting in. And we're going to leave that for 15 minutes for everything to start to activate. It's been 15 minutes and my findings, my vin clear has been set here, starting to work its thing. I'm going to give it another quick little swish around, pop our airlock out and gently pour it in. There we go. Pop our airlock in and give it a good swirl around. And make sure it's all mixed in. There we go. So the way findings works um, is that the findings happens to be all negatively charged particles in there. And within the wine, any of the sediment that's in the wine is positively charged. And so they attract each other. 
and then they form big clumps and bigger clumps and bigger clumps and then they all start to, to settle out and create a layer of sediment down at the bottom. So what's going to happen now? This is all going to start to clear over the next couple of weeks. So I'm going to pop it somewhere nice and cool to clear, about 15, 16 degrees. And then once it's absolutely lush and beautiful and clear, it's going to be then ready for you to rack off into a nice new clean sterilized demijohn. And then from there into six sterilized clean bottles. Then pop the quartz in, leave it in a nice cool place out of the way uh, for about six months. Pop open a bottle in six months time after you've left it in the fridge to get nice and cold, nice and chilled. And you're going to have a fantastic, really fruity, um, nice level of um, the plumminess is going to come through, it's going to have, because of the skins from the plum, it's going to be a nice dryness to it from the tannins as well. And you're going to really enjoy your plum wine. As I've said, you can use this for any type of plum. So you can use it for damsons, you can use it for nectarines, you can use it for uh, peaches, uh, green gauges, apricots, anything like that in that family you can use this recipe for. Each time, obviously, you're going to get a slightly different colour and a slightly different finished wine. But try it, try a few different fruits, see what comes out like. Anyway, back to this. This goes back into my cool place, about 15 degrees C now, until it's absolutely lovely and beautiful and clear in about two weeks' time. And then we're going to rack it off the sediment and then bottle up. So, hope you enjoy this video and um, hope you enjoy your plum wine. Happy brewing!